you have the murder of a British member of parliament by a far-right sympathizer. Eyewitnesses to the killing heard Thomas Mayer say, Britain first, over and over, as he stabbed her to death. We cannot control immigration, all the while we're members of the European political union. What Brexit showed us is that the far right can win. You know, this has been a bitterly divided campaign. We've got our country back. Every single Western European country has a powerful far right populist party today. A new movement is rising in Greece. Slogan, clear the filth. We have to liberate Europe from the monster of Brussels. They want to undermine the Central European project. We cannot accept unlimited numbers of migrants and refugees. Every so often, Europe disconnects itself from its traditions of tolerance and liberalism. Every single party on the radical right uses this to show that Europe is a Christian continent. The Muslim is the new enemy. Marine Le Pen, leader of the far-right National Front Party, described the street prayers to an occupation. Je ne veux pas que mes filles soient cachées sous des burqas. We will see more ruptures, more extremism, more anger, more frustration. My generation need a European dream, and there is no European dream. Western European idea, social liberalism, free movements of people, are now being replaced by a form of thinking from Orban, Wilders, Le Pen and Farage all over the continent. The rise of the far-right populace has just as much to do with the failure, particularly of the centre-left, to speak to the hearts and minds of the working class. We have created a narrative of fear, of, of exclusion, and we are losing a huge opportunity. There are many people who see Europe as interfering in their affairs. There was no such thing as homogenous ethnic nation states ever. Western Europe was the part of the European Union that set the terms for so long. Clearly it's being challenged now. The European Union's values are no longer global. I don't believe in this idea that democracy is only for, you know, the Western Christian society. What is happening is, I think, the emergence of a new political field with new political movements, new political parties who want change. Europe is in the throes of a far-right populist resurgence threatening mainstream politics and the very idea of European integration. Nationalism is playing a key part in elections across the continent, while Europe waits to see how far the far right has come and how far the European Union has left to go. To understand Europe and where we are today in terms of European integration and some of the phenomena we're seeing in the contemporary period, we do have to go back to that Europe that no longer exists, the post-World War II Europe. There was one overarching sentiment among the elites, but also among the people, and that was, this should never happen again. This was then supposed to be the beginning of a period where there would be no world war, that the future generations would be spared the scourge of war, and therefore nationalism was to some extent to be suppressed. Europe, divided by nationalism and devastated by war, was to have a new beginning and it would be ordained by the leaders of Britain, the US and the Soviet Union in the Crimean resort of Yalta. Yalta shapes the post-war landscape that we see all the way from 1945 to 1989, including the positioning of the Iron Curtain. The fate of the East European countries was controversial. Russia had suffered so badly at the hands of Germany. But at the same time, the language of the Yalta conference seemed to guarantee a degree of democracy and pluralism. And when that doesn't happen, there's a sense of those promises about pluralism being shut down. In February 1945, US President Franklin Roosevelt, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin 
marked out a joint plan for a liberated Europe. It set in place spheres of influence for Soviet and Western interests and would lead to the creation of East and West Germany. But Yalta went beyond allocating the spoils of war. It ushered in the beginning of a new grand narrative. Stalin's primary concern was what he called security. It was quite clear that the countries that the Red Army occupied would remain part of the Soviet sphere. And then the Americans and the British started to become more suspicious of, uh, of Soviet motives and to see Soviet aggression as uh, something that they needed to, to deal with much more. If the US was to challenge any Soviet aggression, then to American minds, a unified Western European bloc would be a vital bulwark. Europe was left completely economically dilapidated, struggling. And at that time, you know, if we think of where is the starting point for what we now call the European Union, in many ways it was the Marshall Plan. The 1948 Marshall Plan, officially known as the European Recovery Program, distributed $13 billion of US aid across ravaged Western Europe. Sanctioned by President Harry S. Truman, and led by his Secretary of State George Marshall, the plan had, at its heart, the aim of a united Europe. The idea that Western Europe should form a federation was taken for granted, uh, certainly by the United States. And when the United States offered Marshall Plan aid, the idea was that the Europeans, uh, in return, would form a United States of Europe. They want to see a united Europe because they think that will attract some of the eastern satellite states away from the Russians. Essentially, it's about making Western Europe in America's own image and also selling America to the Europeans. This is cultural imperialism. In May 1950, two years after the Marshall Plan had been put into effect, France's Foreign Minister Robert Schuman laid bare the vision of European unity. Europe ne se fera pas d'un coup, ni dans une construction d'ensemble. Elle se fera par des réalisations concrètes, créant d'abord une solidarité de fait. The Schuman Declaration had been drafted by French diplomat Jean Monnet, paving the way for the Treaty of Paris in 1951. It now brought together France and West Germany, along with Italy, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands, to establish the European coal and steel community. Jean Monnet would be its first president. This was Jean Monnet's idea, that you create a supranational authority to hive off coal and steel, which really was seen at that time as the sinews of war, and if you hand those over to the supranational authority, which is called, actually called the high authority, then war becomes impossible. In 1955, he set up the Action Committee for the United States of Europe, a pressure group that went beyond preventing war. It aimed for nothing less than a European superstate. It was an idea that found powerful friends and common purpose across the Atlantic. Hundreds of thousands of American dollars were put into Jean Monnet's own action committee for the United States of Europe. Uh, and the CIA uh, was doing everything it could to promote it. Uh, and uh, the CIA was doing that through uh, the US Act Committee for the United States of Europe. And so using the CIA, using covert funding, trying to create the impression of a groundswell of opinion is thought of as much more effective in terms of pushing the Europeans down the Federalist Road. A federal Europe would consolidate what the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, had been set up to do, keep Soviet power in check. By 1955, just weeks after West Germany entered NATO, the Soviet Union formalized the Warsaw Pact, drawing in nations from Central and Eastern Europe 
in a common counter-purpose, challenging Western domination. Europe was once more the centre of ideological struggle. The European continent becomes uh, a, a battleground between Anglo-American influence uh, that's trying to uphold and expand liberal democracy versus uh, Soviet communism, which is really uh, tied up with anti-fascism. Anti-fascism is crucial for the Soviets. The view was, well, we've defeated fascism, now we have the right to, uh, to govern this region, we have the right to install our system. And that system was based ideologically on the notion of anti-fascism. At the core of Soviet anti-fascism lay a charred distrust of nationalism. But the communist hierarchy, now under Nikita Khrushchev, was quick to understand that national traditions had political value. Instead of suppressing those cultural traditions, uh, at one point in the 1950s and 60s, the Soviet Union decided to let them flourish a bit. Uh, all under the Soviet umbrella, people were allowed to explore you know, soft versions of nationalism, the cultural versions, but anything political was deeply frowned upon and just frowned upon by repressed uh, aggressively by the Soviet state. The Soviet Union favored uh, a model of national communism. So despite the fact that you had an official ideology of internationalism, there was nationalism within certain, uh, certain communist regimes. Nationalism was tolerated by the communist regime when it served its purpose. But when that purpose was in the interests of sovereignty, tolerance turned to belligerence. In Budapest, for example, in 1956, the uprising, which is genuinely an attempt to take Hungary out of the Warsaw Pact and to reintroduce a form of parliamentary democracy, is condemned by hardliners within the Hungarian regime and by Moscow as the work of fascists. Some 8,000 people are believed to have lost their lives in the face of Soviet tanks and artillery. So anti-fascism in Eastern Europe is becoming anti-Westernism. By the late 1950s, the division of Europe into two ideological blocks is a political, economic and cultural reality. The 1957 Treaty of Rome transformed the six nations of the European coal and steel community into the European economic community. And by August 1961, the Iron Curtain that symbolically divided Europe in two is made real with the building of the Berlin Wall. Eastern Europe was closing itself off from the West, but at that same time, the West was opening up to the rest of the world. It initially started from Southern Europe, and so countries like Germany and uh, Belgium, and particularly in France, would get people from Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece. But by the late 50s, early 60s, there were simply not enough people, and they reached out to other countries, most notably Turkey and Morocco. There was a need for labor, and so um, Central Europe was able to absorb, for example, the 12 million German expellees from Eastern Europe, the so-called guest workers in Germany from Turkey, uh, or in Britain, uh, the arrival of uh, non-white immigrants from the Commonwealth. Europe was experiencing an unprecedented boom. The European economic community was absorbing foreign workers whilst keeping Britain out of its increasingly wealthy club. But as the British government sought integration with Europe, some considered the integration of new arrivals to Britain as a route to ruin. In this country, in 15 or 20 years' time, the black man will have the whip hand over the white man. Well, I can already hear the chorus of execration. How dare I 
stir up trouble and inflame feelings by repeating such a conversation? My answer is that I do not have the right not to do so. In 1968, Enoch Powell, a former British government minister and serving member of the Conservative Shadow Cabinet, delivered a dark vision of a multicultural Britain and handed the far right new legitimacy. You have people like Enoch Powell actually saying this kind of stuff. It means that groups on the fascist fringe can suddenly get some credibility, some respectability, because it seems like they're saying the same stuff as this figure, Enoch Powell. But even put Enoch Powell to one side, when you start introducing legislation, immigration laws, that in their underlying premise is, is actually accepting that far-right narrative, right? That Britain is a white country, but you also have the authority of the entire political system legitimizing this perspective. And that's really when the kind of fascist movements in Britain get their great opportunity to cross over into a much more mainstream place. One group, more than any other, would seize the opportunity and prey upon public concern. We do respect the black man, but we don't want to mix with him. The National Front is founded, begins to campaign very strongly in the east end of London, uh, in the Midlands, and in some northern towns. Uh, and it offers overt racism and xenophobia and anti-Semitism, and begins in some areas to connect with, with an anxious population. By the 60s, of course, Europe was, was booming economically, and there started to be the need for migration. Do you recall, either of you two, what, how, how, that, how, how that message was conveyed from the governments of European countries to the workers of their countries that, you know, there are people going to come over here from other countries and, and work in the factory with you? How, how did they say that to people and, and, and was, it, was it accepted as, 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 as logical, if you want your economy to grow, that you're going to have to get people in from other countries? As I recall it, uh, in this country, it was presented as this is the Commonwealth. These are Commonwealth citizens. No, sure, that's a specific thing about the UK. And they should be free though, to come it? here. Yes. Now, don't forget, uh, as far as France is concerned, uh, North Africa is a part of metropolitan France until terribly recently. So Algeria becomes independent in 62. Mm -hmm. And there's constant traffic. I mean, first of all, there's, I think, about 3 million of the so-called PNOR, the, the North African French. And then over time, gradually, uh, you get many more North Africans finding work. And Germany is doing something very similar, not from ex-colonies. Uh, it's saying... The Turkish Gestapo, I suppose. Turkish But don't forget Greek, the Italians, Italians and yes. the Greeks yes. and yeah. the Yugoslavs. Yugoslavs. I mean, they're all Austria. coming and, in the and, 60s. That they yes. take on migrants because it's cheaper than investing in new machinery. The human capital is cheaper than actually investment. And that is a mistake, if you like, that capitalism makes, uh, that... You bring in large numbers of people um, who then turn out actually also to be people, not just... And the idea that you, people with different skin colours and things like this would just arrive, I, I, I imagine, must have been quite, quite shocking to people with, without them necessarily assuming that they were racist themselves. Would you think that's right or not? Well, this is, a, a, of course, a wider issue, but we were in Greece on the uh, other side. We were exporting labour. And uh, this was a, a time when Greece had been, of course, after the Nazi occupation and we went through a civil war. So it was quite a, quite a difficult time of uh, reconstruction and, and, and poverty in Greece, which uh, then uh, many people left their villages and went to Germany and other parts of the world also. But Germany was the main uh, destination as Gastarbeiter, then, of course, the guest workers. I mean, one thing also about that particular time period, and if we're talking about migration, we have to remember that in the 1960s, you also have the Iron Curtain, the Berlin Wall. So a lot of the, say, individuals that could have come in as guest workers from other places, they're more European, you could think of it that way, uh, from Central Eastern Europe, uh, were no longer able to move. And they were no longer able, like the Poles weren't able to go to Germany easily, et cetera. So that natural migration ceased to exist uh, because of Soviet expansion, if you want to think of it, after Yalta and after World War II. 
And so if you think about what the, the case that Germany found itself in after the war was, yes, of course, it was cheaper for them to bring in Turkish uh, guest workers to rebuild uh, versus investing machinery or retraining their own workers. Okay. But Can I just dissent somewhat sure. from that? First of all, uh, you're also looking at very, very considerable internal migration within Europe. There's a huge Italian migration to Germany in the 50s. They go home for the most part. So the Germans think, OK, we can import guest, guest workers, Gastarbeiter, because they'll go home. But then they discover they don't go home. And ever since that time, they don't quite know what to do because they've become very good at making Germans out of Germans, yes. but are not good at making but do you Germans think, out do, of everybody do, else. Do you, th do you think the, the, the people who are running the countries at the time, do you think they just expected guest workers to go home when the work wasn't there anymore? Were they surprised? What about the, the, your, your migrating Greeks? Do you think that they ever thought that they'd go back home or did they decide that they... Well, that's where the world nostalgia comes from, is the <laughs> desire to go back to your your homeland, and and uh, that's been uh, as, uh, since ancient times. And um, the desire to return is there. I would say in Germany that's certainly the case. In France, Britain, no. I think those who had come here were here to stay. By the 1960s, Germany was not ready to assimilate people of a different skin color. And above all, I think a difference in culture. As Western Europe was struggling to come to terms with new arrivals from distant places, in the East, Soviet power was once again beating back indigenous calls for change. The failed Prague Spring of 1968 showed the limits of peaceful protest against the iron will of communist control, setting in place an uneasy new normal. In Eastern Europe, what you see at this time, particularly after 1968, is what was called in Czechoslovakia normalization. In other words, uh, the stagnation, really, of the political system. This is where you know, our, um, our image of the communist uh, period as grey and bleak and environmentally degraded really comes from, of Soviet society as being kind of payoff where the rulers no longer uh, try to make people believe in uh, communist ideology and the people just try and get by as, as best as they can. People in Eastern Europe got by keeping to a strained status quo with the creaking communist authority. For those in the West, getting by meant getting to grips with transformational change. At the beginning of 1973, after nearly three decades of looking in from the outside, Britain, along with Ireland and Denmark, finally joined the European Economic Community. The EEC had grown to nine member states. Later that same year, an economic cartel on another continent would shock the world and force Europe to face its immigration challenge. In 1973, the oil crisis happened and the European economies were, were pretty much in recession. And that ended the guest worker program and pretty much ended economic immigration, legal economic immigration to European countries. A hike in the price of crude oil by the multinational oil cartel OPEC sparked an economic crisis that was part of a wider downturn in European fortunes. It would leave the so-called guest workers with no work and no thought of going back to where they came from. The irony is that actually the numbers of immigrants kind of went up after that, particularly through family reunion. Workers were more visible because they, um, they came with their families, with uh, wives, with uh, children, and they were supposed now to stay. It was clear that the guest workers weren't going home. 
And only then, when they weren't going home and they increasingly moved out of their kind of factory-owned apartments and went into mostly white working-class areas, that it became an issue because only then it became clear that they were here to stay and they were going to be part of society. So many tensions appeared, but the problem is known. You need someone, you use that person, and when you don't need him anymore, you ask him to go back. That was a problem. And, you know, in a country where there was a big crisis, uh, the first tensions appeared. And that is pretty much where the politicization of the debate started, mostly within white working class, because they were the ones confronted with them. And that's where far-right parties started to pick up on them. Foreign guest workers had now become visible local fixtures. In France, this shift brought disparate sections of the far right under the leadership of one man. All of these different groups with different roots came together in 1972 in the Front National. And one of the leader, the, the main leader was Jean-Marie Le Pen, who actually also had kind of a foot in several of them. Le Pen is a former military uh, uh, commando. He is quite populist. He's charismatic. He's able, essentially, to dominate that space. Jean-Marie Le Pen transformed Front National from a kind of an, an old elitist, you know, backward-looking far-right party with extreme right anti-democratic tendencies into the prototype of the modern populist radical right party, where he started to say that he was the voice of the people and that he said what other people thought. And he was the taboo breaker, and the big taboo was immigration. Jean-Marie Le Pen was long established in the French nationalist movement, but had failed to achieve any popular success. Many considered his views of non-European cultures as racist, with anti-Semitism a recurrent theme of his politics. But with guest workers now seemingly a fixture of French society, Le Pen's new Front National saw a new opportunity. C'était, j'avais le sentiment que la France perdait du terrain et que, à la suite de ses échecs, et qu'elle allait, qu allait connaître d'autres, d'autres épreuves, en particulier relativement à la décolonisation. Et c'est à partir de là que je me suis engagé et donc j'ai mené à partir de là une campagne politique de, de risorgimento, si vous voulez. This self-proclaimed resurgence of far-right sentiment wouldn't just be confined to French soil. But just as the far-right looked to take advantage of anti-immigrant sentiment and economic uncertainty, their ideas would achieve a victory, but leave their parties at a loss. The pressure on mainstream politics to start talking about immigration, to restrict immigration, particularly non-white immigration, these are things that mainstream politics responds to, often by stealing the clothes of the far right. They think that the way to see off the challenge of the far right is to adopt uh, some of, if you like, the more palatable uh, varieties of its, of its politics. Uh, and this shifts the political discourse in general to the right. In Britain, the National Front had increased its support during a decade of political and economic turmoil. But in the run-up to the 1979 general election, Conservative Party leader Margaret Thatcher would steal the clothes of the far right and steal a march on her rivals, including the National Front. And I think it means that people are really rather afraid that this country might be rather swamped by people with a different culture. For the first time, we start to get this idea of culture being the dividing line and this idea of an alien culture coming to overwhelm a sense of British national identity. And that language had been National Front language, had been Enoch Powell language, now it's mainstream Conservative Party language. 
Margaret Thatcher makes an overt play for National Front voters. At the 1979 general election, the National Front essentially falls flat. Eve at the origin of the, the, his death. Now she's just coming into Downing Street now. Here comes the Prime Ministerial Rover and Mrs Thatcher out of the, onto the doorstep. The Conservative Party victory in the 1979 UK general election marked a turning point in European politics. Mr. Dennis Thatcher, her husband, standing behind. The next decade would bring defining social and economic shifts and lead to the far right being both embattled and emboldened. The 1980s is when you see the restructuring of the Western European economy. And at the end of it, it's uh, an almighty transformation. It's the beginning of what nowadays we would call neoliberalism. It's, the, it's the, the free market has to be the dominant way in which society is organised. Where post-war Europe had been built on primary industry, coal building, um, ship building, car manufacturing, and you see the economy has shifted towards the service sector. So the deregulation of the banking system, the opening up of financial markets, financial services, is one of the most enormous uh, economic changes uh, of modern uh, European times. The changes were led by Margaret Thatcher's conservative government, which pushed through radical reforms. The shift to the right of mainstream politics that had sidelined the British far right was matched by changes to the economy that proved to be both decisive and divisive. The country that had long remained in post-war Europe's shadow would now light a new way for others to follow and for the far right to exploit. Lots of communities in the northeast of England or the northeast of France, places that have been reliant on single industries are now in massive decline. And this allows, I think, for uh, those uh, incubating far right movements of uh, the post-war period a kind of opportunity. You know, after the war, there was such resentment against anything that smelled of, you know, fascism, far right, all of these ethnic ideas, particularly in the 1960s in places like Germany and Austria, when they really came to terms with what their leadership had carried out. Uh, and so as a result, there was, of course, this undercurrent. You know, in every society, you have some fringe extremism. Uh, but, you know, in terms of movements and political parties, these kinds of groups didn't really emerge in a real way until much later. At the same time as all this was happening, you, you were starting to see the white backlash against migration, the rise of the far right, the National Front in, in, in the UK. Uh, later, in, in the 1980s, similar projects in other countries. Well, I remember there, Sweden. There, there was a lot of resentment. Uh, I mean, it it happen, takes about a generation for the long-settled native population to get used to incomers. Um, of whatever color. The problem with the non-white migrants is that they couldn't assimilate, so multiculturalism was devised for them. Uh, there was resentment. I'm thinking of the Notting Hill Grace Riots of 59, which shocked the establishment, the British establishment. And then they started to establish various institutions and so on. And we've moved on. I mean, I think this country's done quite well in terms of integration. Let's just move on a little to the, to the 1980s, when, when Margaret Thatcher spoke about the country being swamped. This, this was the point in time, wasn't it, where we started to see the start of the assimilation of right-wing ideas into the political mainstream around issues like migration? Yes, I think that what we are seeing is a lot of the uh, mainstream right-wing ideas uh, merged with some of the uh, ultra-right uh, ideas also. The migration issue, of course, um, has affected both the right and the left in, as parties, and, and there have been divisions and, and from a different point of view. Uh, migration was used to fight strikes so that if you had a strong union, yeah. you bring in foreign labor people. or other labor or other ethnic groups and they will, uh, they will break the strike. But, but clearly so, by, so, by, by, by the 1980s, you know, the collapse of all that traditional industry anyway, the, 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 the emergence of well, this, this, you know, the financial sector, the big bang in the, in the, in, 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 in the financial district. So there the, you... the, the old blue collar jobs were disappearing yes, and, as well. Yes, and you see then, uh, particularly in France, a lot of the voters for the Communist Party moved to the right yeah. and toward to the ultra-right. 
And why is that? Because they see the foreign worker as uh, somebody who's uh, undermining their basic standards because they will work for cheaper or they'll work uh, on, you know, on the black, as they say. This was an easy way to divide um, and polarize our societies and, and even in the working movement and undermine the strength of the unions then. But of course, there were other issues too. As you said, there was deindustrialization. But this was also a very good political view of, okay, let's divide the people and divide and rule, in a sense, uh, from the sort of capitalist point of view. I completely agree about uh, the working class being a cleavage in, in this process. And if we look at the rise of those, these early far-right parties, particularly the National Front and also the Freedom Party in Austria, these are the two parties that have been around for quite some time. The majority of the others are relatively new. Um, they really didn't hit... Um, any sort of electoral success until they figured out how to access the grievances of the working class. Until they figured out that was not a constituency they could just write off because that was always going to be the labor parties and the, and the central left they were going to take those individuals up. Because society was just niche racists that they were, they were attracted to. No, the I actually think what they figured out is that because of bigger processes, if we take a step out of an increasingly globalized society, increasing integration, yes, Factories were closed. This was happening across the Western world, not just in Europe, of course. Um, and these, you know, individuals were upset. They were losing their factory jobs. And then you have, uh, you know, a savvy po politician like Jean-Marie Le Pen come in and say, well, look, um, unemployment uh, is not, you're not to blame. Um, it is the immigrant that is to blame. In 1983, French President François Mitterrand's socialist coalition was roundly defeated by right-wing opposition in municipal elections. The following year, a controversial television appearance by the leader of the Front National would help the president reclaim lost ground and lead critics to question the opportunistic timing. Le Pen got on one of the most watched programs in the debate and Le Pen turned out to be a fantastic speaker. On top of that, the party was modern, had very good um, propaganda, targeted pretty much uh, guest workers and targeted the elite for either not discussing it or for allegedly um, siding with guest workers. Ça a créé, uh, je pense, uh, um, une cristallisation de l'opinion uh, qui, um, qui a dit, voilà quelqu'un qui, qui dit tout haut Ce que nous pensons tout bas. De responsabilité. Ceux qui m'entendent et ceux qui m'écoutent peuvent témoigner que j'ai toujours dit que la politique que je souhaite voir appliquée à l'égard de l'immigration étrangère, c'est-à-dire l'inversion du courant de l'immigration. Il n'y a pas de politique démocratique possible euh, si vous n'avez pas accès aux médias. Parce que euh, <rire> même ceux qui hésitaient à m'inviter euh, pour des raisons idéologiques, Euh, pensait que j'étais quand même un bon client sur le plan de l'audience. Donc ça a peut-être contribué à, à amoindrir leurs réserves. Vous sentez la, la, la conscience la, la tranquille. Grande, la grande responsabilité dans cette affaire. Jean-Marie Le Pen's Front National was largely absent from mainstream French television. But his 1984 appearance on the political debate program L'Heure de Vérité was a milestone that four months later helped secure 2.2 million votes in the European parliamentary elections. The Front National's grab of right-wing votes away from mainstream right-wing parties struck a chord with France's left-wing president. In 1985, in what some claim to be a cynical manipulation of national politics, Francois Mitterrand changed France's electoral system to proportional representation. It was a move that the following year would help the Front National claim 35 seats in the French National Assembly. What he was trying to do was use the National Front to damage the centre-right in order to bolster his own uh, electoral prospects. But that lets the genie out of the bottle and the FN begins to acquire credibility. The Front National had representatives uh, at the Assemblée Nationale because of the decision of Mitterrand to change the system, the political system. It was a revolution to 
uh, to see this party being represented, represented uh, in the Assemblée Nationale. What happened was that not just uh, Front National emerging, but actually the first parties to enter um, the national parliament were in Belgium, the Flemish bloc, and in the Netherlands, the Centre Party. Where the Front National played a major role was that they were really the inspiration of other parties. Far-right parties were emerging as a political reality, while the European economic community was enlarging to include Spain, Portugal and Greece. The 1980s drew to a close with increasing Western European unity. But the East would experience a seismic contraction. President Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika reforms failed to save the Soviet Union from collapse. The West had won the ideological war, and the fall of the Berlin Wall would symbolize the end of the 20th century's grand narrative. Nationalism, suppressed and manipulated by Soviet power for half a century, was now freed from the communist yoke. The Soviet Union stagnates and then collapses. W was this the point in time when nationalism started really to come back in Central Eastern well, Europe? Well, that was the thesis put forward by countless Western journalists. These are really deep down, dubious, fascistoid people. And this is nonsense, of course. You, you, you agree? I, I completely yeah. agree. Uh, in, in reality, what was happening was that you had populations who had very little experience uh, of what we call democracy, learning the process. There, were always a, there would always be a minority, five, seven percent, um, declaiming outrageous views. And that was there. The focus was on that. So the rest of the people said, well, wait a minute, you're not taking our efforts seriously. Uh, but in fact, the elites, and I think much of the population said, we're going to try and accept the democratic system because we want to join Europe. I was curious then, while, while this was going on, that, that, that nationalism was on the rise in, in Western Europe. This is the, the thing, the paradox. I completely agree that there was this view, particularly after the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, that now that you don't have this supranational dictatorship controlling all of these populations with Central Eastern Europe, you're going to have this unleashing of ethnic nationalism. And these countries are going to devolve into wars and nationalist dictatorships, and all of these kind of fear mongering. But of course, that, that didn't happen. Um, and in fact, Central Eastern European countries, if anybody that had gone there when they were under the Iron Curtain would have known that since the 1960s and 70s, there was mass cynicism about the Soviet Union and everything that it, prom it promised in its ideology, as, as you know very well. Uh, and so there was a desire, a deep desire to be part of the West, to have democracy, to have access to consumer markets, capitalist markets that could bring you your televisions, blue jeans, all of these things, computers, yeah. right? And so in the constituencies... She was on the block in Moscow when the first McDonald's opened. Oh, I, I was that. in that line, I'll tell you oh, yeah. that, in 1991, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'll tell you one, one little story about how cynical it was, in fact, when, uh, when my family immigrated from the Soviet Union, we had to go through Moscow, and I was uh, a child then, and my mother asked, uh, do you want to go to the Red Square and see the Kremlin? Because we never thought we were going to come back at that time. We were refugees from the Soviet Union. Um, and, or do you want to go to the first McDonald's? And there was, the line was about the same for both, about three hours. And of course, we went to the McDonald's. This was how much, you know, as a child, uh, you wanted those markers of the West. I mean, that was really the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, you know, going back to the, to the earlier point, of, what was happening and how it was viewed. And I think there was a certain, probably unconscious desire on the part of the West to see problems where there were none. I mean, I can still remember Western journalists, without exception, but especially the Americans, are saying there will be an inter-ethnic war between Hungary and Romania. Why hasn't it happened? Nobody ever tackled it. What failed to transpire in Hungary and Romania would ignite in the Balkans. 
Communism had held the multi-ethnic Republic of Yugoslavia together since 1945, despite being outside Soviet control. But as communist rule fell, Yugoslavia fell with it. This was the eruption of ethno-nationalist warfare on European soil. There were regions where you had, in some cases, a minority in the majority and vice versa. When it started to unravel, these ethnic and political tensions, which were in many cases instrumentalized for political gains, it was something that Europe hadn't anticipated and Europe wasn't ready for. On the one hand, it reinforced the Western images about Eastern Europe as being a powder keg of nationalism that had just been held down by, by communism. On the other hand, that vision also kind of strengthened the idea that um, these countries should be integrated into the European Union and, and into that, that union of, of peace. Prior to the wars in Yugoslavia, the 1990 Charter of Paris had already drawn Eastern Bloc countries into the West's ideological framework. As Europe's axis shifted, European integration was on the threshold of a historic union. But nationalism, far from consigned to history, would threaten to pull Europe apart. Two thousand fifteen created the perfect storm for the radical right. The problem of security became an important issue for French people. Refugee equals terrorist. We've encouraged different cultures to live apart from the mainstream. Either Hungary becomes a corridor for migrants or we build a fence. President Putin has given support to far-right movements to hope that Europe disintegrates. The danger is forgetting what demanded the integration of Europe in the first place.